the presence of the Trinity Boy Wolf drawing exhibition being in Dundee at the Cooper Gallery. Dundee is also lucky enough to be hosting the Lines of Sight exhibition that we are focusing on in this evening's conversation. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to be able to convene conversations as rich as this one will be. Drawing runs through everything at Duncan of Jordanston, where I'm lucky enough to be Professor of Drawing and Making. It's like a pulse of creative activity. And in these events, we celebrate drawing's inclusivity, dynamism, radicalism and accessibility. This commitment to the form is demonstrated in, the, in exhibitions such as these and in how drawing informs our curriculums, learnings, communication and expression. I'm also very honoured to be leading the new MFA drawing at DJ CAD that starts in September of this year. Tonight's event explores how drawing encourages deep thinking, dialogue and engagement with place and the past that will have impact on all our futures. Art and archaeology make very good bedfellows, given that the visual arts can be viewed as a vast, if a little uncoordinated, but effective research project that is attempting to excavate what we are and where we've come from. The marks that we leave behind mirror back to us what we know about the world and what we feel, and importantly, what we can't put into words. But our speakers tonight have both words and images to share with the audience. I'm going to introduce you to our panel. Um, Dr. Gary Gans G Sangs Sangster <laughs> is the UK curator of Lines of Sight exhibition, an exhibition in response to Ashley Hoyka. I knew I'd say that wrong. We did practice and I knew I was going to say it wrong. The oldest known village is in central Anatolia, which has inspired a dialogue between art and archaeology through the works of 13 Turkish and international artists. Gary is also the director of Drawing Projects UK, the organisation that promotes the Trinity Boy Wolf Drawing Prize. He, is an in, he has international experience as an art educator, curator, writer and museum director in Australia, New Zealand, Europe and the USA. He was curator at the New Museum of Contemporary Art in New York and director of the Contemporary Museum Baltimore, an innovative museum dedicated to collaboration and intervention with civic, cultural and educational institutions across Baltimore. He, is, he was executive Director of Hedlund Centre for the Arts in San Francisco, a West Coast leading artist in residence programme, Director of Artspace Sydney, and Dean of the Art Institute of Boston, Lesley University in, bon in Boston. Gary is currently an honorary research fellow at University of Dundee and is our chair for this evening. Stephen Farthing is an artist and educator based in Jordan and London and joining us this evening from Egypt and is one of the artists in the Lines of Sight exhibition. His extraordinary career as an educator has meant his influence is felt by many, including myself, many people he has taught or reached through his extensive publishing and lecturing. His paintings have been exhibited around the world, including representing Britain at the San Paolo Biennale in 1989. His technically highly skilled paintings all seem to be grounded on one guiding principle, that what we see will always be conditioned by what we know. One way you might consider his dynamic practice could be described as establishing his own particular relationship with the past. He is passionate about drawing and has made extensive practice-based research into the drawings of others, including John Ruskin's Elements of Drawing. Stephen is also an honorary research fellow at the Duncan of Jordanston. Blanca Moreno is an artist based in Colombia and an exhibitor in the Lines of Sight exhibition. Blanca is a Colombian artist living in Bogota, after finishing her MFA studies in Chelsea School of Art in London in 1985, 
Blanca Moreno's work has been dedicated to paint, draw and document her constant journeys across her native country, Colombia, with special emphasis on the investigation of the amazing and vulnerable relationships between the creatures that form a particular landscape. There are several recurrent themes in her work, rivers, forests, rainforests, mountains and cities. The process involves travelling, drawing and then her developing the body of work back in the studio. Her work has been exhibited in London, Bogota, Ecuador, New York, Rome and Germany. She has also been a drawing teacher at the University in Bogota, and she's illustrated books and magazines for children and adults on the themes of nature, landscape and scientific information. Our final speaker for this evening is Anita Taylor. Anita is Dean of Duncan of Jordanston College of Art and Design at the University of Dundee. She is the founding director of the foremost annual drawing exhibition in the UK, the Trinity Boy Wolf Drawing Prize and Drawing Projects UK, a public facing initiative dedicated to drawing. Her passion for drawing has made her a central figure in the community of practice around drawing, both online and offline. After graduating from the, uh, her MA painting at the Royal College of Art, she became artist in residence at Durham Cathedral and then Cheltenham Fellow in painting. Her academic leadership experience includes having been Executive Dean of Bath School of Art and Design at Bath Spa University, Director and Chief Executive Officer National Art School in Sydney, Australia, Dean of Wimbledon College of Art, University of the Arts, London, Director of the Research Centre for Drawing at University of the Arts, London, and Vice Principal of Wind Wimbledon School of Art. Taylor is also an exhibiting artist in the Lines of Sight exhibition, currently on display at Duncan of Jordanston. Um, we will be sharing insights, thoughts into this exhibi exhibition and the process and evolution of this show and these will also have an after ripple because we'll also I've asked all the panel members to supply a drawing prompt a simple instruction that will hopefully encourage some of you to draw as you continue to think about the conversation we're having this evening um, I will remind people that if they have questions or comments that they want shared with our panel, um, could you type those into the chat function of Zoom and they will be relayed um, at the close of these presentations. So it only remains to say again, thank you so much for the invitation to convene this conversation and thank you to our panellists for being here. Over to you, Gary. Um, many thanks, Tanya, um, for that extraordinarily detailed and uh, fulsome uh, introduction uh, to myself and to the artists who was being tonight. Um, the focus of this panel really is um, to discuss, well, first of all, I'd like to thank the Cooper Gallery for hosting this project and for linking lines of sight um, to the Trinity Boy Wolf Drawing Project. So we have an opportunity to talk about just not one exhibition, but two exhibitions um, over the course of uh, the next month or so. But our focus tonight will be on the Lines of Sight exhibition. Um, the premise of the Lines of Sight exhibition is that it's an outcome of a research project. Um, before I proceed, Tanith, can you share my screen? So while you work on that, um, what I'd say is that this research project, which has been going on for a number of years, and um, the basic research question that the project posed is, what can practicing visual artists um, uh, learn and uh, teach um, through collaboration uh, with archaeologists on a particular archaeological site, in this case, the Shikli Hoyak? So, as I said, the exhibition is an outcome of um, a particular research project. Um, and the research project involves the archaeologists at Ashikli Hoyak um, inviting a number of artists um, to be involved in research on site at uh, uh, 
archaeological site in central Anatolia. Um, and the product of their work, the outcome of their research, the um, artworks produced were um, drawn together in this particular exhibition. Here's an aerial shot of Ashikri Hoyak, so you can see that it actually is an archaeological site um, located in, in central Anatolia. Um, and the project has uh, includes artists from Catalonia, Colombia, the UK, and Turkey, and the curators. There are two curators, one from Turkey and uh, one from Australia and the UK. Um, all of the artists are listed there. Um, Osgol, Eva, Sahin, Amet, Leila, Stephen, Murat, Ozanan, Blanca, Dilwyn, Hakan, Anita, and Emre. Um, and they come from various uh, countries. Uh, Ferrat uh, is from Turkey and I'm from Australia and the UK. Um, our speakers tonight, as Tanya said, are uh, Stephen, Blanca and Anita. And we are focused on the idea of drawing as the outcome of particular research. So the process of putting this show together was, uh, first of all, the research conception, which is to do with that question of the collaboration between archaeologists and artists. Um, various site visits that artists undertook over a period, um, not just of months or weeks, but years. Um, some of the artists visiting several times and uh, one artist not having the opportunity to visit at all, um, but doing the research in dialogue with archaeologists. Um, the research that was undertaken was in consultation with archaeologists, so there were dialogues um, taking place. The production of work and the conception uh, and exhibition development and finally um, an exhibition tour was developed which included um, on-site exhibition at in Istanbul, Turkey. Um, then the lines of sight presented at Dundee at the Duncan of Jordan Stone Matthew Gallery at the University of Dundee. And finally a, the show will be present, the exhibition will be presented along with similar public programs at the Autonomous University in Barcelona um, next month, starting uh, in late April. Um, and the public program that's gone along with the exhibition tour is really to, sit, to attempt to situate um, the process of, of the research and the um, elements of that research that are comprised by the artworks into the dialogue about the nature and meaning of the archaeological discoveries at Ashikli Hoyak. There is a proposal to, to return the exhibition to Aksarai, um, and that's in the working stages um, at the moment. So uh, part of the research involved artists being on site and gathering, um, documenting source material of various kinds. One of the artists who's not speaking tonight, Dylan Smith, for instance, gathered a, an indigenous plant from the region Verbascum and used um, the petals of that plant to create a dye in which he um, dyed paper and the paper was then in turn used to uh, create an installation. Um, here you see an image of um, uh, two of the lead archaeologists um, uh, talking about the archaeological site and the five layers of the city of um, Ashikli Hoyak. So there's a number of qu basic questions that the research attempted to undertake, and I want to um, just briefly outline those. Um, number one is how do one, artists undertake research and how may that research differ from the inter interesting ways uh, that archaeologists pursue knowledge? And if there are differences in, the, in those processes, how important are they and what are they like? Um, secondly, is how contemporary art can address, engage with, or interpret our understanding of the past in a different way from the science of archaeology. Um, how knowledge, understanding, and insight about ourselves and the world that emerges or is discovered through art differs from the knowledge that emerges from science. How art visualizes and represents the world um, quite differently in many ways. Um, and in doing so, um, generate certain models of how we see the world and how we understand the world. 
Um, how, in particular, phenomenology of perception and experience of things like light, colour, materiality, shape, scale, sound, how all of these things interact with and um, how we interact with them and uh, uh, we derive meaning uh, from the world from those. Um, how the processes and rituals of life generate meaning, um, like the shape of the dwellings or tools, the styles of clothing that might have been used um, or decoration, forms of burial, ways of cooking and eating, artifacts that are recovered, of which there are very few at Ashikli Poyak, and the structures of worship or religion or belief, um, and how that knowledge is documented and recorded for the future. Um, how the actual resonance of place, because the, um, the site of Ashikli Poyak is a very, um, uh, erratic place. It has a great sense of aura uh, about it. Um, how, the, how the resonance of place and embedded cultures and histories um, is quickened and reverberate, reverberated when sub, subject to different kinds of analysis, whether it's archaeological science analysis or whether it's um, artistic expressive analysis. Um, and finally, through the exhibition itself, how the public audiences are exposed um, to significant, this significant site of research and to the art generated in response to it can amplify the meaning and incorporate into their sensibilities um, uh, the perception of what they encounter um, uh, when they come across this material. So I just wanted to quickly present to you a series of images of, of the exhibition in Istanbul. So there were a series of didactic panels which were created by the archaeologists which talked about the history of the site and the process of the archaeological research into the site. In addition to that, there was um, a fantastic historical video and two of the archaeologists talking specifically about their work at the site of Ashikli Hoyak. So in, in a sense, if, if we go back to those two slides, we could think that um, there really was a context set for the presentation of, of this work. Um, then Osgul's work was uh, uh, to do with the body and um, the deterioration of the body. Um, and it was a representation of a body um, constructed out of pigment. Um, Eva Bosch's work is a, um, uh, uh, a short video which documents the transition of light across one of the model houses that uh, have been built at Shikli Hoyak. And um, Eva's work is really a, um, a meditation on the universal quality of light and quality of time that hasn't changed in the 10,000 years since um, light may have traveled uh, through that, through that um, dwelling in, in the past. Um, Sahin, um, Norman's work is um, a, a, a large, a life-size three-dimensional sculpture of a hunter-gatherer um, with various um, uh, uh, burial um, uh, remnants um, in, the, in the pedestal, embedded in the pedestal, so that life, in a sense, um, is built um, uh, upon the graves of, of the past. Uh, Stephen Farthing has done a series of uh, 90 drawings um, based on his research in consultation with the archaeologists. Um, one, one set of drawings were about burials and the other set were about um, uh, food, uh, which is um, uh, a fascinating topic, um, both in archaeological terms but in the present day as well. Um, Murat talked about the... Um, uh, created a, a photographic installation um, in which he split the city of Ashikli Hoyak into two to talk about um, two sides of, of the cultural experience of the people. Um, Ahmet and Harkin um, did a complete mapping of the site uh, in order to produce a um, digital um, interactive augmented reality experience. Um, if you presented your phone um, to the appropriate QR codes or the appropriate 
um, image, um, it would animate um, the images, bring them to a sort of uh, a living experience or a lived experience. Um, they also talked about the anthropomorphic nature of some of the artifacts found on um, the Ashikli Hoyak site. Uh, Blanca Marino, um, who will um, talk tonight about her work, um, has done an extraordinary series of drawings of, um, uh, titled Animalia on a uh, uh, five-part drawing um, on goatskin goat parchment um, dealing with, with animals um, from the period. Uh, Osman's work was to do with um, um, timelines, um, the idea of documenting various kinds of production of food and subsistence um, over the course of a 10,000 year period. And it's a, um, a graphic summary of um, that kind of encounter with knowledge. Uh, Dilwyn Smith, as I said, dyed paper and created, um, used the ladders that were prevalent in, um, uh, in Ashikli Hoyak to um, emerge from and enter the dwellings. And um, uh, he presented that in terms of sculpture. Uh, that's Dilwyn and Anita in his installation. He also did a performance with one of the archaeologists who happens to be a musician. Um, who played a background guitar for his performance. And uh, Leila Ahmadi had done a lot of work with um, um, various kinds of construction uh, materials, in this case, sort of concrete blocks or gravel that might have been, for instance, taken from the site, um, in, just in terms of dealing with ideas about construction. Anita Taylor's work is in the background. Um, and Emre's work, which he made as a series of individual drawings, but they formed a vast compendium of notebooks, notebook drawings that he um, took during the course of um, his uh, visits to Shikli Hoyak. So that's a quick run through of the introduction to the project, some of the questions that uh, will be dealt with. I encourage you to ask questions in the chat. We will leave the questions till um, the end after each of the presenters have um, spoken. And I'll invite now Stephen Farthing to make his presentation. Thank you, Stephen. Okay. Um, so I'm Stephen Farthing. I have had a very nice introduction from Gary and from Tanya and thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to start by saying what a pleasure it's been to be involved with this project. I think um, this is just 10 minutes, so uh, I'd like to start by saying what I think drawing might be or what it is for me. And it is um, uh, a way of representing in two dimensions, um, not just what I see, but what I think about what I see and also what I know before I start looking and as a result of looking at what I've drawn. And my starting point with, the, with this project was that I, was, I knew one way or another that because of COVID and because of where I lived and my commitments elsewhere, that I would not be able to visit the site. All I could hope to do was learn about the site by talking to others and by looking at visual information that was made available to me that I could find on the web and by entering into conversations with people who had an intimate knowledge of the site. Um, and primarily, they were the archaeologists involved in interpreting the site, and I'm sure to some extent actually revealing the site physically. Um, now, my, uh, that was my um, starting point as how on earth would I begin to make some drawings. Now the reason I decided to make drawings was th that uh, I knew that these draw the uh, visual evidence that I built would have to be sent somewhere and um, uh, the logistics of sending large paintings which is what I make for my own pleasure and uh, do exhibit, uh, the logistics of sending those things around the world have become more and more complicated. 
and that the easiest thing to do was to make some drawings. And rather than making big drawings that needed to be packed and rolled and folded or whatever, um, I thought I would work on A4 sheets of paper that could easily be packed into a UPS envelope and dispatched in a couple of days to anywhere in the world for a modest amount of money. And so that was the format. The um, method was to write to um, primarily one of the archaeologists and ask them questions. And rather than um, leaving those questions as something in the background of the image uh, intellectually, I thought I would leave them in the background of the image physically. So what I did was draw on uh, the emails and uh, written information that was made available to me to answer my questions. And so the, 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 each drawing that made up this collection of 90 drawings for each work um, was made onto a sheet of A4 that was printed off from my computer. Um, the art historical starting point for me was Dürer's drawing of the rhinoceros that became a woodcut. Um, he'd never seen a rhinoceros. Um, he relied on some written information from somebody who had seen one and a sketch that somebody else had made. And he built his rhinoceros from a set of words and a rough sketch made by others. Um, the rough sketch and the set of words I'm not sure still exists, but Dürer's woodcut of this uh, rhinoceros is enduring. It may not be accurate, but it is built from information gathered through exchanges of information with others who have had actually seen a rhinoceros. Okay, cut. So I started work on the project by writing to others and asking questions. And the two questions I had, because as you've already established from hearing Gary talk, um, there's not a lot of visual excitement information. There are no mosaics. There are no wall paintings. Um, there are no decorated vases with histories on them. Um, there's some buildings, there's some floors, there's some evidence that people cooked food lit fires and there's some evidence that they ate stuff and there's some evidence of what they might have eaten and there's some evidence of how they buried their dead which is very very basic information we stop there and say but maybe that is the essence of life is built on very very basic information like what we do with our dead how long we live and what we eat and the very serious question of keeping warm and keeping sheltered to preserve our lives. And um, I think, you know, that if you have any questions about why bother about thinking about Neolithic life, um, just reflect on what's happening in the Ukraine at the moment. And you very quickly realize that um, the main things that sustain life and sustain our sanity are our relationships with our family and other people, having a home, having warmth, having food and feeling secure. And that it seemed to me that to make just two drawings, one of them was about how we buried our dead and the, and the other, you know, and the, the greatest artifact left in the end are our bones. And the other is how we kept warm and perhaps cooked food. Might be a good starting point for beginning to build a relationship with a culture that I knew absolutely nothing about. Got about two minutes left. And through a dialogue with an archeologist living today in Turkey and me sitting in a studio in um, Jordan, making these drawings, reflecting on the words of somebody who was in another place, um, who had an expertise that I don't have, 
enabled me to engage with the business of making a two-dimensional rep representation of my thoughts about something I knew very little about. But by the time I'd finished up doing these drawings, quite a few months before the war in Ukraine started, I could see the point of bothering with archaeology, bothering with thinking about Neolithic culture, Neolithic times, which is, you know, basically, I think, 7,000 years ago. Um, there is still a point, and that um, it may not be like studying economics and understanding why uh, the cost of wheat is escalating at the moment and the cost of uh, oil is escalating as a result of this war. Um, but uh, I think it engenders empathy and that maybe one of the really important points of any kind of project to do with the visual arts is that we somehow, through empathy, draw our audience in to think about things that in the normal turn of life they wouldn't think about. Thank you for giving me the time to talk to you. Thank you very much um, uh, for that presentation. Um, Blanca Moreno, um, we would like you to make your presentation now if possible. Uh, in 2017, uh, I, thanks to the invitation made by Eva Bosch, an artist, who initiated the whole idea of collaborating uh, with anthropologists and the artists, and Mirivanos Masadan, who's the director of the, um, of the um, uh, excavation, I traveled to Turkey and spent 18 days in Ashikli Hoyuk. Uh, it was a unique opportunity uh, to see and to feel uh, the Cappadocian summer landscape. Uh, and also, it was a, 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 a unique opportunity to be able to share with archaeologists and specialists their daily routine. Uh, they would go in the morning to the, to the site and they would come back in the afternoon with what ha they had collected and work um, preciously on their, on their own investigations. The Cappadocian landscape, now here in the, in the image, uh, it is a, it is a uh, uh, landscape based mainly uh, with, by the wind and by the minerals, the different densities of minerals inside the rocks uh, form these incredible shapes and, and amazing formations of the Cappadocia. I could I also... Um, the, uh, and very um, at night the celestial vault with the Milky Way slightly um, slightly in diagonal which is very different from the Milky Way we see here in the tropics that we have it on top of our heads uh, and sitting down in the early morning at dawn uh, I, I had the opportunity to uh, imagine and to ask myself how would that same landscape that maybe hasn't changed as much as we imagine uh, was lived by the early uh, inhabitants of the zone. How um, I, I sometimes I would sit down Or wild boar tapping over the rocks, swift passing by of a bird, and um, and I asked myself how deeply related uh, and what kind of relation did the people in Ashikli had with their surrounding animals, knowing that their survival depended very in, in the majority, especially at the beginning of the of the site. Uh, on a uh, hunting wild animals. Uh, usually, we have, can have a glimpse and open to open to interpretation with sites that have artistic expressions, 
um, we can interpret from our own their uh, art and we have a slight glimpse of what they could have thought, they could have felt, but that is not the case in Ashiki Huyuk because there hasn't been found a very wide uh, spectrum of art pieces. There's the yellow and, and, and red uh, painting over a floor with a diagonal. And uh, there's some expressions, but not so much. So um, how gradually, how a diet based on hunting wild animals was sheep and goats mainly. Uh, that can be investigated by the team, that has been investigated by, by the team and by the specialists, and I could read those papers and it was extremely interesting for me. Mm, the, that process of, of domestic years ago had time evolved to our present forms of the uh, I think we have reached a decisive moment in our history uh, because at the, now with genetic engineering, with all the science investigation, we can alter the biology of many animals, plants, and even ourselves. Uh, and that is why uh, the main idea that runs through these drawings uh, is that the, at the core of our humanity, we share with all living beings a deep sense of wilderness and a common ability to change our lives. And that is the main uh, aspect of, our recognizing, of recognizing our humanity. Be because we can see ourselves in relation to the rest of the creatures that inhabit the world. We recognize ourselves as humans in relationship to them. And at the moment, I think uh, that um, link, that um, sensitivity of feeling, feeling part of and feeling uh, related to all creatures in the planet is essential um, today. Um, that is the main idea. Of... And, but of course, there are many other considerations. One of them was very interesting because uh, well, as I traveled to Turkey, I could see that uh, there was a room with mineral pigments on the floor with that diagonal half red, half yellow, ochre yellow, and uh, I could see on one of the reconstructed uh, um, uh, rooms, houses, uh, a parchment, um, a goat skin uh, on the wall. So I decided to uh, work with those materials uh, because we still use pigments for our drawings today, 10,000 years afterwards. hunting of the animals and uh, as a territory there are more of course much more goats and much more sheep in in, in Ashiki Uyuk and the nearby towns than there are wild animals so I decided to work on them freely uh, and the parchments impose certain limitations on me because I had never worked on parchment with their with their little pores and, and their structure and, and they behaved themselves as they wanted. I, I would enter the room and they would be I, I sometimes wet the, the parchment and they would drink and do things. It was like having a, a some goats, uh, some crazy goats here in the studio. So it was very interesting. And the, the, of course the mineral pigments in the black from smoke. Uh, was used then. So even though I had those limitations, I felt I gained a new freedom 
uh, working with the shape and with the um, uh, of the of the skins and also I tried because that landscape is is uh, a landscape where I think the draws are celebrate of our Uh, with the beauty uh, the mystery of natural life that's, that's, that's what I have to say mainly and uh, I can answer any questions that you feel later on uh, many thanks Blanca um, I'm sure there'll be questions later on um, during the session I would like to uh, pass on the next session to Anita Taylor um, to make a brief presentation. Thanks, Anita. Um, thank you very much, everybody, and thank you for inviting me to speak uh, about my contribution to the project. Um, and I'm going to take you on a canter through the site because actually that's part of the challenge of how I went about, or what the challenge was, thinking about how we mark space and time and make a relationship to a historical uh, site. So my slide presentation starts with a, my shadow on the site and trying to think about the site of a Shikli Huyuk in the terms of, of my presence uh, ten and a half thousand years later uh, from this settlement. So the project itself, I was invited as um, Blanca has said by Eva Bosch who uh, was an artist in residence on the site for many years who had the idea that bringing artists together to work with the archaeologists, which was adopted and absolutely embraced by the archaeological team, uh, would be a good idea. So this is us on our first foray out in 2009. Um, being introduced to the site by, by Professor Mimran Osbran, who is the director of the site. She is a professor of archaeology uh, at the University of Istanbul. And the thing that's really astonishing about a Shikli Huyuk is its wonderful interdisciplinary nature as an investigation. The site has very little evidence of material culture, but what it does have is evidence of life, how people lived, and making a space for humanity, civilization, a community coming together um, in this extraordinary context. Um, I went out on this visit uh, to the site, really unsure about how I, how I would respond to the site or what I would contribute. My work exists in an interior world to some degree. Um, and for me, this idea of being out in a very big open space was quite a challenge. I didn't know my way in. The very first day, Miraban took us on a tour and she knelt down to draw a diagram of the site and the way that things came together in the settlement in the air. So for me, the marking space and time was instant with the archaeologist making a drawing for us, which was her way of communicating to us exactly what the site was about and how it functioned. It's an unusual site. There are experimental reconstructions. So these are experimental houses that demonstrate how they lived half below Earth half below the ground and half above. It's an incredible environment, very hot in the summer, snow, completely covered in snow in the last week. Um, so this living half underground, half above, is part of the survival. It's part of the really rationalizing an architectural design uh, for living uh, in the Neolithic times. And the entrance to the houses was from the top. So they didn't have doors, they were protected, so it's sealed in the heat sealed in the cold, and they entered the houses in and out from the top. But the site is a vast expanse. It's set in the hook of a river, um, and you can see the evidence of buildings coming together. It's the first early settlement with what appear to be streets, but they're not wide enough for anyone to pass through. So what they were designed for is a big question. And you can see these circular holes in the earth, in the ground of these houses. So they may be halves and there may be burial chambers. Some of them are both, and some of them, well, they have both. Um, so the site, as Gary has said, is five layers. So it's a layered site. So there are wonderful things about drawing 
around layering. There is, there's a sense of drawing through volume and space. And I went out and I took a lot of photographs. I spent a lot of time walking the site, absorbing, thinking about it, and making terrible drawings that were my way of trying to understand what I was seeing and trying to come to terms with this vast amount of earth, of settlement, uh, of history, uh, through something such as humble as a piece of chalk uh, and paper. So lots of things that really were never going to go anywhere, but they were about situating me in that place in order to think about what we were documenting and responding to. I've been an artist in residence at Durham Cathedral, as you heard. I've worked in other cathedral settings, other historic settings, been an artist in residence in the New South Wales Wildlife uh, Service on Middle Head. So I have had some experience of dipping my toe into nature and finding different narratives and connections through that. But the site has really quite remarkable things. It has tools made of obsidian, which are the things on the left. And the wonderful thing that happened on the site while we were there is they discovered a seed for which they take and generate new life and new growth. So they have a capacity to think about how do we regrow things that existed a long time ago. They also, they made the experimental houses facsimiles to try and understand how things work based on data, on evidence, on deconstruction of the information that they have. And here on the left, they were forming a center of a bowl using this dark carbon. So for me, again, a kind of drawing into space. Um, and they were also reconstructing how the bodies were buried. So these are both the archaeologists learning through thinking and doing, finding a way through, which for me had a parallel to the relationship of drawing. There's a research centre, field house, they call it something else in archaeological worlds, uh, near the site where there are lots of things that are being stored and catalogues near this is the obsidian store. Um, but the other find that they have on the site is a skull which exists in the museum, uh, which bears the evidence of trepanation, so early brain surgery. So we're talking about a very sophisticated, civilized, if we see that as civilized community, where they're actually thinking about health and well-being, care, and actually interventions through surgery using obsidian. And this is one wonderful lump of obsidian found in that store, which as you can see is this glassy mineral and it's the most astonishing um, of substance. It's glossy, it's shiny, it's sharp, it's hard. And for me, there are no mirrors found in uh, Eshikli Hoyuk. These are from Katal Hoyuk, which is a little further to the southeast, southwest of Eshikli. Um, and for me, I suddenly have my moment of what my connection was, which was to think about obsidian as a mirror. And of course, obsidian is the same as a clawed glass. Uh, it is a black, a dark mirror, so it has both emotional resonance and physical substance that made a connection. So very briefly, the drawings it makes a connection to, for those of you who don't know the work, I work to think about how we respond, uh, how we understand or how we see ourselves. So the obsidian is super exciting to me because that's actually about the first moment perhaps somebody saw themselves as in a reflection and how they would then perceive themselves with their two lenses of their eyes to adjust, to think about their relationship to themselves and what they actually looked like. I've spent a career thinking about how looking in reflections, looking in mirrors, helps us to consider what we look like, how we present to the world, and the discrepancy between what that looks like, feels like, and is. So just to set a context of the drawings I was making and the space I had to make across time to think about how I would connect with the site, these are some of the drawings on show in 2017 uh, in South Shields drawings again using the idea of the frame becoming the mirror they're propped they have the relationship of the mirror to the subject these are at wells cathedral so occupying spaces which are not necessarily white cubes and the series that i recently made was something called the witness series and i've been interested throughout my career from one from the moment i was an artist in residence at durham cathedral tasked to respond to the cathedral 
my response was as a witness. It was as a witness, an observer, and it was about making a testament, um, making work that acknowledged the present and reflected on the history and the context, the narratives and the myths of the place. This witness series are very much about thinking about the gesture, the expression, the concept of looking and being a witness in our time and they existed as a very large expanded series of drawings shown in close proximity, so over two meters high, and drawings that were really about looking and not looking, understanding what it is to see, understanding what it is to avert our eyes. My response, I found challenging uh, to a shikli, but it was to continue to think about what it was to be a witness and to make those drawings um, to continue from that legacy of those drawings, to think about the larger than life nature of being in the present and that act of being a witness. And then starting to realise that my connection to the site was through the burials. It was through the only hard evidence I felt there was um, of the occupancy of the site of humanities, which were the burials and this particular skull uh, which I started to work with rather reluctantly. I wasn't sure I wanted to be a drawer of skulls. Uh, but what I was interested in is the relationship of the head, and then this one, the back of the head to the front of the gaze of the witness. So I've made, in response, and there's still work to respond to, it feels to me very much the beginning of a project, um, to think about, after three years, it's the beginning of a project. Um, because the moment of um, synthesis, the moment of coming together to understand what I wanted to make was in the act of making. So we have drawings which are witness drawings. It's called the Witness Series Ashikli Hoyuk. And what they're trying to address or to imply is that space between the present, the looking, and the, and the regarded, the looked at. Uh, and the looked at being obviously the space of ten and a half thousand years and that we are all just human. So for me, um, that was really my response was to think about how I located the sense that the activities were the same, the living was the same. It was about shelter. It was about coming together as a community. It was about finding ways to grow and to survive. And it was ultimately really quite a levelling um, deep experience to think about the capacity uh, across time um, to make those connections. And I've just put this image at the end, which is actually an image that I made a long time ago as a collaborative drawing project with some students from the Commonwealth. Um, and of course, it's a facsimile of the drawings that we find everywhere in early civilizations of our imprint, our touch, our need to touch a surface, to understand our touch, our gesture, our shape, and to leave an imprint on the world. That's me, thank you. Uh, thanks, Anita, and thank you, Blanca, and thanks to Stephen as well, who's, um, who's not with us, um, unfortunately, any longer. He had to um, go off to tend to uh, his family. Um, I'm wondering if if we have any questions. So um, I guess I'd make a couple of comments. I'm not quite sure they're questions, but um, listening to the three speakers tonight, um, one of the things that comes through uh, very strongly is the notion of the role of art and culture in general and representation in this case through drawing, but representation in general, is to do with it, its capacity to stimulate um, an empathetic response to the real world, um, stimulate an empathetic engagement with um, what it means to be human and what is good about that, and as Stephen pointed out about the war in Ukraine at the moment, what might be bad about that as well, in terms of, of humanity's capacity um, to you know, engage in negative conflict. 
but um, this idea of empathy and identifying um, our contemporary um, feelings, I guess, and I think Blanka mentioned that word, feelings, um, towards um, the past in order to attempt to understand the past, I think, comes through very clearly in the making of this work. So the question, and, and the second thing that comes through is the, um, I, I guess the provocative nature of materials, the way that materials in a sense provoke a sense of identification. So whether it's the uh, Vavascum that Dilwyn used or, or whether it, it's the sense of the landscape that Blanca responded to or whether it's the use of obsidian in terms of the construction of a material that, that uh, construction of a mirror, that the materials really trigger a sense of um, sort of creative interaction. So the question that I would have from those comments uh, is a hard question. It's, it's what do you suppose, speculating here, asking you to speculate, what do you suppose those kinds of observations and perceptions, what their impact might be on the science, on the real science, let's call it, of um, archaeology, of identifying what went on and what it meant. So I guess I'm asking what, what does your work or work in general of this nature, this research-based nature, what kind of impact it might have on the science? I think the impact is about a different lens of looking and a different way of seeing and a different way of making, actually, I mean, I, I believe wholeheartedly that we create new insights, knowledge and understanding, particularly through drawing, but through creative practice. And I think the, the synthesis of information and material and responses to it allows other people to gain different insights. I thought it was um, interesting when we, we did a seminar earlier on, which was focused on the wider group of artists. We focused particularly on the artists who draw uh, within the project this evening. Um, but I, I thought it was really interesting to hear we had Trevor Watkins, Professor Trevor Watkins speak, and he was in the audience. Uh, for the other and with actually his conversation and commentary was about the way that we could bring I guess that synthesis and that reflection rather than the deconstruction that goes on uh, in the archaeological discipline so my sense it's about a rounding and that we're very rounded in terms of our knowledge structures and um, concepts so actually if we we don't do a single channel we actually gain much more by uh, you know, the nation, I mean, and the Shikli work is really fabulous because it really does have botanists, anthropologists, and archaeologists, people like us coming along to um, question, they have aspirations to work with different art forms um, in order to understand the site in a new way. So not just to provide a, a lens to draw attention to it, but actually to make real connections. Blanka, would you like to add anything to that? Is that possible? Yes, I think my, my thoughts are on the same way as Anita. I think for the archaeologists and the scientists uh, must be interesting to see how we create knowledge, uh, as you say, randomly in different ways, and the whole corpus or the whole body, sorry, body of um, of the, either investigations, expressions, um, have, I imagine, um, triggered some, some ideas at any point. I imagine there, as, as for us, their investigations trigger ideas, trigger our work. We seem to have frozen, unfortunately. So 
Uh, do you want me to take the question from Tanya? Yeah, why don't we move on to um, Tanya's we can, question? Uh, hopefully, hopefully we'll recover uh, yeah. Blanca. Um, uh, the question that Tanya about archaeology um, as a whole order of knowledge trying to process difficulty with death um, is something that I think is absolutely fundamental to that. Um, because clearly it's about cataloging history, cataloging residue, sediment, um, and extracting from that um, all the evidence of how we lived. So very much so. And for me, that was really the, for me, that was the only space um, and, the, and the kind of resounding um, message for me was that sense of, uh, you know, coming to terms with, I mean, it's coming to terms with death on a daily basis if you're uh, working in those sites. And the burials there are so extraordinary. They're not necessarily buried with family members. There's a, a whole order of uh, understanding yet to be unearthed, to get the um, phrasing, um, in terms of understanding those burial practices. But of course, essentially, yes, it's coming to terms with what it is to be Human. And I think in a way that's why the alignment with drawing and mark making, something that has always been there, um, you know, the use of carbon, the use of the things that, you know, there is evidence of the use of carbon and charcoal on the site, but not in terms of drawing and images. So the, there's a whole set of resonances there which really are about how do we place ourselves in the world. And for me, the coming to terms with the, this, you know, this huge time span. I'd been, you know, working a little bit with Stonehenge and Avebury, thinking about frameworks for artists, but but you suddenly realise the time difference, the span is so vast uh, to get back to a Shikli or York. I mean, it's ten and a half thousand years. It's massively older than um, Stonehenge and many of the other places that we think are really, really ancient. But of course, they are all connected and they're connected by our quest to, to understand that history and that past. Do you, do you think there's an advantage that that drawing has over, over other forms of art in terms of this identification with the distant past? Well, I think what, what, is, what surprised me uh, when I was at Ashikli, and what surprised us when we go uh, places, uh, old places with art, is that we still do the same marks as Anita said. We do, we carve, uh, we draw directly with our hands. Uh, whoops, it's gone now. Uh, and so I, I think that direct relationship between the head, the heart, the arm, the, the hand, and the material directly is um is it's been there always and that privileges a little bit drawing and also it is also a matter of that it is very easy to 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 do it uh you don't need any 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 one of these or whatever so that is very interesting i find um and i also think that in terms of it being a two-way process um, is also part of it, that dialogue between making the mark, understanding what we're seeing and how we're seeing it, um, is integral to that process of drawing. And I think somebody's put in the chat the process of it being described as a process of sieving. Um, that analogy to being on an archaeological site is rather wonderful. And that sense of something that's very primal, something very instinctive, and something that we know was an activity um, seems to me to be very profound. And for me, it's about perception and not documentation. Um, what, what would you hope that the archaeologists might derive from this, um, this interaction and this exhibition? What, what do you think that they might? how they might benefit from this? Well, I think the, the what they would benefit from, uh, I mean, it, one would hope that the, 
I mean, I think in all good, in, I'm going to say something slightly differently. In in the context of all interdisciplinary projects or multidisciplinary projects, because it's not necessarily art to archaeology, although that's how this is framed, there are also these other disciplinary activities underway. Um, my sense is it's about a trust and respect across those disciplines to think that you might find something anew and the openness um, and the genuine intellectual inquiry and open inquiry of the archaeological team at Ashikli Huyuk, I think is partly the ground on which new understanding and thinking can be that. I don't know what they got out of it. We need, that's another conversation to know exactly what they got out of it and another analysis. But what we do know is that the response and the dialogues that we've had to date as the outcome of the exhibition have been incredibly creative. And don't forget, they are creative too. They're reconstructing, but also people like Gunnis, um, who's the one of the archaeologists on the site, is a you know a professional musician. Um, so you have a different different set of lenses. And I think it's the different set of lenses and the spaces in between and archaeologists very patient, caring, attentive practitioners, if you like. And I think that also aligns very closely to the sense of a, a, a practice of drawing. Um, for me, it was the attention, the parallel activity. I don't know if that's feeds back the other way. That's a, a question I can't answer, I think. Was this project, uh, I guess, what will you, uh, Blanker and Anita, take away from this project? Has it, has it added something or changed something for your practice that you can, can see, or is it still um, percolating? Well, I think it will go on percolating, uh, but um, the main thing is um, uh, to, to ask myself uh, how, as, as, as a whole world, we share this common heritage, because we do share a common heritage and a common culture, and, and, and we build knowledge um, through uh, the dialogue between all parts of the world. I myself, I found um, similarities in such different landscapes, um, uh, the same families in another part of the world, the same um, made me think I have traveled a lot to the Amazon and I have uh, seen archaeological sites in the Amazon and uh, to be able to, to, to acknowledge what is similar and what is absolutely different. Um, but uh, on the end, the dialogue is necessary. We cannot live um, in one part of the world only. So, um, and many things, how, but mainly our common heritage. Um, I, I agree with you, that common heritage in that sense. Uh, I mean, the, I think, you know, the mystery of why they all left to Shikli, Bayouk, um, may also have other resonances, which, you know, talk to us about very difficult social context we don't know um, fully but we do know the site was abandoned and they moved on and the sense that perhaps they purposefully didn't leave much material culture um, so I, I think you know it's a really curious site that leaves a lot of questions about how we live how we exist how communities form how they disperse how do we live how do we how do we manage within kind of quite a hostile if you like environment we all live in a hostile environment in terms of you know the way we have to accommodate um to find a way to live but and some more than others of course so for me it's that sense of how do we how do we understand that i'm going to go back to the question about the archaeologists i think the, the comment from trevor watkins was really important because it was about that you are able to make the connection through history to people and how they lived or the sense of how they must to provide an insight i would say 
um, and and actually that real recognition that if you're a scientist and you're analysing and you're kind of looking at all the small parts and components, sometimes it takes a, a different set of thinking minds to make a whole, to form a synthesis or to make an observation uh, that creates and makes sense of things. And we do that all the time in all sorts of different disciplines and different contexts. But for me, has it changed my practice? Yeah, it challenged me. And it challenged me to think about what it was to be a witness over a vast amount of time, how to document that and how to pray um, to make a testament to that through drawing. We might draw it to a close now. Um, what I'd like to do is, is thank Stephen Farthing, thank Moreno and Anita Taylor for their um, really quite extraordinary um, presentations about their work uh, in the exhibition lines of sight. And um, I'd encourage you, if you happen to be in Dundee or next month, Barcelona, to try and look at the exhibition in person in order to have um, a sense of, of what was being attempted in this project and exhibition uh, in terms of generating that dialogue and about enhancing the possibilities for um, contemporary audiences to engage with and understand um, the peoples and their lives uh, in, of, from a, a particular Neolithic period and Neolithic site, and to recognize what um, the understandings that have been developed through this um, project um, bring to our um, recognition and understanding of what it, what it means to be human now and uh, what our practices in turn, our contemporary practices might mean, whether they're augmented with technology um, or whether they're to do with um, doing what we normally do, which is um, in, engage in familiar relationships or um, look, uh, look after uh, ourselves or to expand our, our knowledge and, and understanding and insight. And I think, as Stephen said, to, to build our, our empathy um, for humanity in general, humanity from the past and, and for the present, and also to try and build a platform for the future. So I'd like to thank the artists a great deal. I'd like to thank the Cooper Gallery, and I'd like to thank um, Tanya um, Kovacs and also Alex Roberts, a uh, co-organizer, um, for putting this um, uh, panel together. And um, we look forward to more dialogues in the future. Uh, over to Tanya. Thank you so much. Um to all our speakers for that incredibly interesting and thought-provoking uh, conversation. And thank you as well to you, our audience, for, for being so present with us during that. Um, so I'll repeat uh, Gary's thanks to Blanca, Stephen and Anita. And thank you so much for his very secure chairing and uh, the curation and conception of this wonderful exhibition. Much to reflect about our relationship with the past and how we draw lines of connection. What it is that we leave behind, um, our understanding of what we can and of what we can't know. And by implication, what is mirrored back to us? What is the archeology span and material culture of our current moment? Drawing has a very particular role in archeology span with its very own specific conventions to the discipline and vocabulary of Mark that serves that discipline and order of knowledge that are purposeful for archeology. span And the importance of process to both archeology span and drawing is something I was struck with this evening many times. It seems wholly appropriate that it's an important aspect to many of the works that were made in response to this remarkable site. Tonight's conversation confirms for me yet again how drawing connects across disciplines and across thought and is a direct form of visual communication through time. 
I think our speakers have all alluded to the notion that investigations like this engender empathy and how precious that is. Um, so I will remind you that we want to encourage you to be making drawings um, in response to some of these thoughts and we will start to circulate drawing prompts over the next few days via the Cooper Gallery's website and various social media platforms. Um, but based on Stephen's work, I'm already planning on making drawings over tomorrow's emails um, as a starting point. Um, many thanks to the Cooper Gallery team. There are people behind the team that uh, behind the scenes that facilitated this conversation fantastically. So particular thanks to Taneth and Peter for their support and facilitation. And thank you to Sophia for trusting Alex Roberts and I to convene these conversations and Trinity Boy Wolf for the invitation to develop this Drawn to Dundee series. So again, with that, with that thought of the future as well as the past, um, just want to wish everyone a nice evening and I hope there's lots to go away and think about. Thank you so much for being with us.